All right. Do you, do you guys have a podcast yet? Nope. Not yet? All right. Cool. All right. Well, my name's Dave Jackson. Were you guys around for the, the keynote this morning? Do I have to go? Okay. Well, let me explain who I am briefly. Um, I've been podcasting for uh, since 2005. I run the School of Podcasting. I now work for Libsyn. Uh, I started there uh, this year, partly because I built a relationship with them for 10 years as a customer. And so when my job went uh, south, I went, you know, I'm tired of being a corporate trainer and losing my job every five years because sales can't hit their quota. Uh, and I thought I would like to work for a podcasting company, and they were the first one I called, and luckily um, they hired me. So that's uh, me. I've written a couple books about podcasting, yada, 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 yay, Dave. Uh, if you want me, I'm at schoolofpodcasting.com. But what we're going to talk about today is growing your audience. And the one thing I want to uh, just start off with, uh, my favorite phone call ever uh, was is a guy named Mark Gunger, and he runs a, and I mean mega church. I didn't know this when I was talking to him. Um, I had reviewed his podcast. I, I have a, a podcast, oddly enough, called the Podcast Review Show. And I reviewed his show. I was like, you know, it's not bad content. It's all about marriage and how to stay married and this whole nine yards. But there was a lot of like just yuckety yuck morning zoo, you know. My favorite is the inside joke. Like you'll get two podcasters and they'll be like, remember that time, man, with the, with the Orange Mountain Dew? I'm <laughs> the Orange Mountain Dew, I can't believe you. And you're like, I have no idea what they're talking about. There was a lot of yuckety yuck. And I'm like, you know, this is good once it gets to the content. So he emails me and says, hey, uh, thanks for reviewing the show. Um, I, w I would like to talk to you a little bit. Uh, and I'm like, hey, I'm bored in a hotel in Michigan doing training. Here's my phone number. So this guy calls me up, first question out of his mouth is how do I grow my audience? And I'm like, well, you know, and I give him the steps I'm gonna talk about here. I then Google Mark Gunger. He's the pastor of a mega church in Wisconsin who happens to have a syndicated radio show and a TV show. And he just gotten back from a giant trip where he spoke to thousands of people in Africa. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe the next time you're in front of a thousand people, mention your podcast. But it's, it's funny in the fact that we always, that's always the question, how do I get a bigger audience? And that's completely understandable because while it's fun to talk to the wall, it's, it's more fun to talk to, to people. So that's what we're going to get into today. So what I want to talk about, and this is where you guys have to chime in. There's no sleeping through this one. Who's got like the best gift you've ever gotten ever? Just like if somebody said, who, who gave you the best gift and what was it ever? I will go first then. Um, when I was probably eight years old, I have an older brother and an older sister. And when you are the baby, everything you get, and I mean everything you get, is hand-me-down. And in my case, it was bikes. And for whatever reason, my grandma um, was inspired to go to Kmart and buy me my very own Huffy bike. It was bright orange. It was awesome. Uh, it would match the T-shirt. Because um, I was thinking about this last night. I'm like, what was one in? And I, because when I say reverse engineer this, why was that? It's a bike. I've had bikes before. What's the big deal? This one was my own. It was not. It was something I never had before, something I always wanted, even though the other bikes worked fine. Um, but the biggest thing was it was my own. And the other thing that was really cool about it is it was obvious that my grandma had put some thought into it a little bit. So who now has a, a best gift ever that you've gotten? Yeah, go ahead. Um, my niece gave me a mug. Okay. And it was important to me because at the time, it was like the start of the time, and she put my logo on there. Nice. Yeah. So personalized. And obviously made just for you. What was yours? Um, for my, when I finished graduate school, my mom got me like a, she sent me abroad. Like, I went to Everett Space Camp. Nice. And that was cool just because I loved traveling. And it was the first time someone actually got me a traveling, got me a traveling. Yeah. Very cool. Anybody else? Yeah. A puppy. On there you go. You can't beat a puppy. Now, did somebody know that you wanted a puppy? See, there you go. So that person knew what you wanted and gave you what you wanted, and you're like, this is the best gift ever. Podcasting is absolutely no different. What does your audience want? I mean, I put myself through college as a waiter. There's really not much to that job. You listen to your, your you know, the, the people who come to your restaurant, uh, you write down what they want, and then you give it to them, and then they give you money for that. I mean, it's really, and this is really all podcasting is. Who's your audience? What do they want? And then give it to them. So that's why we say, to me, I always talk about reverse engineering. And I said this this morning. I said, everything that I watch on TV, for me, makes me either laugh, cry, think, groan. It either educates me or entertains me. One of those. 
And if it's not doing any of those, I mean, I, right now, it's, it's interesting. I'm watching a show called Mr. Robot. Anybody watch that? It's on, uh, it's weird because at the end of every episode, like I start every new episode thinking, okay, maybe I'm gonna get some answers on this one. And at the end of it, they haven't answered any of my previous questions and I have more, I still don't know what I'm watching and I don't know why I'm watching it. So I'm trying to figure out why am I watching that? Cause it's really kind of frustrating, but it's got that kind of whole like, well, it's like lost. If you guys ever watch that show, you're like, what am I watching? So think about what you watch, what you consume, especially the things that you like. Like I get most of my news, I used to get it from the Daily Show because it was news and it was entertaining. So keep that in mind. First things first, growing your audience. Um, it's, it's harder than it used to be, but if your audio is horrendous, and by that I mean it's distracting from the content. If I cannot pay attention to what you're saying because I'm just obsessed with the fact of how you say it. And what I mean by this is when they come in and they're like, welcome to the Dave Jackson Hour, but here's Dave. And it's like, hi, welcome to the Dave Jackson Hour. And you're like, what? So my favorite is, look, it's really, really quiet. So you're like, you're in the car, you're like, Tah. and you turn it up and then they go, now let's get to our weekly segment. And it comes on at like regular volume and your windows shatter in your car. And you're like, oh, that will get people to unsubscribe quicker than anything. Um, there's a service called Blog Talk Radio that uses your phone. And the fun thing about a phone, and this has nothing to do really with Blog Talk Radio, it's a phone problem. Phones, this is back, back in the day before there was, you know, whatever, fiber and all this other stuff. A phone could only handle so much traffic. So they cut everything that's basically below kind of a human voice out. So all the super bassy stuff is gone. And all the super trebly stuff is gone, which is why when you talk on the phone, you sound like this, right? It's all mid range. So when you do a phone call, it kind of sounds like the phone, which is okay, tolerable, because people do that every day on the radio. But it's when you then take, you, you start with mm, audio and then you kind of dumb it down, it just ends up being horrendous. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing is, um, again, it goes back to what does your audience want and are you giving it to them? I remember once I was, there was a podcast and the title of it was you know, um, something like 17 tips for computer teachers. And I'm like, oh, this is meant for me. Awesome. I turned it in. And literally, I'm going to say it was at least seven minutes, the guy ranted about how much he hated Bob Seeger. And I was like, really? Any time now? And he's like, I can't believe this. And turn the page. And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, okay, any, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. And at eight minutes, I was like, eject, we're done. You know. So get to the point. When you think about it, um, when you go to Walmart, right? And that person says, welcome to Walmart. He doesn't say, hold on a second. Okay, no, no. It's, he just says hi and lets you go in and do your stuff because you know what you want. You're going to go get it. So the more you, you know, your, your intro of your show should be, here's the show where we blank, you know, so the school of podcasting where we help you grow your audience, start a podcast, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I get into it and I usually try to tease the audience because, again, we're all busy. And I'll say today on the school of podcasting, um, Three things that every podcast needs, and it's not a microphone, it's not uh, bandwidth, and it's not downloads. And people are like, it's not? Well, then what is it? So it's an intriguing title. Or, you know, so-and-so got to, you know, do a TV show based on a tweet. I'll tell you the story later. So anything you can do, and you go, oh, kind of like they do on the radio? Yeah, kind of like they do on the radio. Um, I have, uh, I, uh, what's the word here? People on radio are really talented because they are, forced to be entertaining with their hands tied behind their back. The way radio is, is kind of set up now, you have minutes in between that, you know, the next 20 minute music block and be funny in 13 seconds. Uh, that's the great thing about podcasting. You can, you have a little more free room to do that. So make sure that your podcast is, is ready for your audience, you know? And we're gonna talk about this. The other thing here that, um, I just, I, to me, this is like a pet peeve. Um, you'll see here, there's a show here, uh, and we're gonna talk about headlines, and, and the, this name of the show is kind of okay, but let me give you an example. We'll start there with your show name, because we like to get cute. Uh, I am guilty of this. Before my, my podcast was called The School of Podcasting, it was called The Morning Announcement. Get it? Because it's The School of Podcasting. Oh, my orange Gatorade story. Nobody got it. 
I did because it was this, so then I had to say, oh wait, hold on, it's the School of Podcasting's morning announcements. Well, then I had to take a breath every time I went to say my show name because it was so long. And I found out that my audience just called it the School of Podcasting. So I'm like, all right, let's just lose the morning announcements because nobody's paying attention to that anyway. And it's cute. And I had a client of mine that was going to do a show called After the Darkness. After the Darkness, right? And I said, hmm. I said, what you want to do is go find your target audience. Don't ask mom because she'll tell you it's great. But go find your target audience and say, hey, I'm going to start a show called uh, After the Darkness. What do you think it's about? And so he did. And the one guy said, is that a band from the 80s? And then somebody else said, is that that vampire thing on Fox? And, then some, and none of them gave him what his show was about. And I said, okay, let's, let's go back to the drawing board. What's your show about again? He goes, it's life after blindness, because he was blind, he was sight impaired. And I'm like, that's the name of your show. I said, go back to your target audience and say, I'm gonna start a show called Life After Blindness. What do you think it's about? And they went, uh, Life After Blindness? And I go, there you go. There was a, um, a show about, oh, Rob was telling me about it, Stargate. I think that was the name of the show, Stargate. Yeah, and um, the guy had some sort of complete inside baseball. It was like the fifth race or something like that, which made sense if you knew the show, but nobody was searching for the fifth race. They were searching for Stargate. So make it kind of obvious. Then this one, so your, your, the name of your show is like the first headline. And there's a reason back in whatever it was, the 20s, they used to go, extra, extra, Roosevelt wins, or whatever it was. It was that headline that got people's attention. So your show should be obvious and, and get people's attention. They're like, oh my gosh, the sled dog podcast racing, you know, oh, I would love that, or sled dog racing, or, you know, um, whatever it is. Then you have these. These are your headlines in the same way that a newspaper has your headline, and then you have your subheadlines. Because I got news for you, nobody reads anymore. We skim because we're too busy. So these are, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I was really excited to hear about episode 56, but then I saw he did episode 58, and I can now, you know, and then over here, his, his description is the same thing. Stay up to date, stay up to date, stay up to date, because he's telling people to subscribe. So it's a lost opportunity. It's a lost opportunity, because if this said, uh, what is this actually about? Hard with style. It's, it's, I think it's a music show. So if this was called, you know, hard rock with style, um, I, I'd be like, okay, cool, I like hard rock, I'm into that. And then if here, if it said, okay, I don't know, uh, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, Judas Priest, um, Slipknot, um, insert hard rock name here, right? Then I'd want to click on those because the whole thing is you're just, you're just trying to get them to click because once they click, right, we just made sure that we're giving our audience what they want and now we're going to give it to them. We just got to get them to click. And so this is something that, and, and some people are really obsessed about, but this is episode 59. Okay, fine. Put it at the end. Put it at the end. My other thing that I've seen people do is I've seen people do this. Hard Rock Style is the name of the show. Then they'll put Hard Rock Style down here, episode 59. Well, you don't have to tell me it's Hard Rock. It's right there. I've already seen it. This is like super... Uh, important real estate and you're blowing it. So you would put the, the name of your guest here, you know, let's, you know, Sir Paul McCartney visits Hard Rock Style, um, episode 59. If that's what you have to do, put it there. This is actually in iTunes, the desktop. A lot of times when you do a Google search, you get what I call the, the web version of iTunes and they really truncate this. So you've only got so much room, so really, really take advantage of it. And that's, I mean, this is stuff that's super easy to do. Um, and if you go, oh, Dave, but I've already got 13 episodes out, they all say episode one, episode two, episode three, you can change them, and then usually within 24 to 48 hours, iTunes will come back around and go, oh, I see he's made a change, and it'll update uh, your listing there. So your podcast, I always say, is like a recipe. It's not a statue. You can change things up as you, you go along, and, and there's a running gag on my show that no one will punch you in the face um, if you go to change something. So... Um, Test shows are great. So we talked about you know, knowing who your audience is and getting someone not named mom to review your show. So if you can find a little test group, think about products, right? When they make, I don't know, um, some sort of new Lunchable or something like that, are you gonna tell me they don't feed that to a bunch of kids first before they spend millions on packaging and marketing and things like that? You gotta make sure your product's okay. And this is where if you can get some people, and I heard this phrase and I love it, let them listen to your show, 
get them in front of you and say, okay, guys, what I want you to do now is talk about my show like I'm not in the room, but I'm going to be in the room. And just say, I'm, I'm okay, you know, if you can. And there's, you know, we always hear the phrase constructive feedback. If you can tell them, look, I'm looking for constructive feedback. Because if somebody says, boring, okay, that's great, but like, why is it boring, right? So, and then when you have a test show, you've got to keep an open mind. And this is where it's tough. I just started doing, I mentioned this morning how I'm involved with this documentary, and I'm doing this podcast about the documentary. And it's weird because normally I get done with my show and I post it because it's mine. I can do whatever I want. It's my podcast. And now I have to submit it to the executive producer who always comes back and goes, ooh, this was really good. Can we tighten that up? And if we do this, and I have found that if I stay open-minded and I actually do that, he's usually got a good point. So when you take this to your focus group, be open-minded. Uh, keep in mind, don't let the tail wag the dog. Because if you let, if just because one person says, oh, I thought it was too long, yeah, but you might have four people said it was, it was just right. So uh, keep an open mind. It's hard, though, because it is, to a certain extent, it's my art, man. I put my heart and soul into it, and they just ripped it to shreds. Well, you know, I'd rather find this out now before I spend all this time in marketing and logos and, and websites and things like that. I might as well find out that this isn't really going to maybe work. It's not that great. They all spit it out right back at me. Um, so you guys ready for the steps to grow your audience? Step one, find a million people and tell them about your show. It's that easy. Uh, but no, there, it, this is the thing that there is, if you're looking for that giant, to me, I picture like a giant golden light switch that I just run over and as I flip it, the angels go, oh, and then just the downloads, just, it just doesn't exist. I wish it did. And we'll talk about how some people make it look like it is, but they cheat. So we'll talk about that. So step one, identify who your audience is. So who wants your audience? If you go, oh, everybody wants my show. Everybody just loves me. No, no, no. Um, if you think about this, I, uh, if you go to, let's say, the post office, the grocery store, and you're standing there, and you've got some talkative old man at Wendy's like last night, um, and he starts saying, ah, how about this weather, huh? Man, phew, so humid. It's hot. And you're like, yeah, holy cow. Hope we get some rain. Do you go home and go, man, I got to tell you about this conversation I had at Wendy's with this old guy in line. He said it was super huge. No, but that's a conversation you can have with anybody, right? It works. And then somebody else goes, what about this election? Oh, I know. It's crazy. What are they going to do? Holy cow. Did you see the report? No. Even if you don't talk about who you're voting for, you can say, man, this is a crazy election. Very superficial, just chit chat, right? But it's when you dig down deep and you say, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a podcast called Biz Chicks with an X, so C-H-I-X, rocks. And they got a bunch of mothers who have young children who are entrepreneurs. And then they talked about trying to run a business with a baby. And just about the time I thought, wow, this is really an intimate discussion, they started talking about sex after a baby. Like how, how do you get back on the sex train when your doctor says, you're good to go. And I was like, as a male, I was like, yeah, 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 whoa, holy cow. But it was amazing. And so if I was a mom with a baby, I'd be like, this was made for me. Oh my God, I felt that way too. Oh my gosh. And you know what they do? They download your entire back catalog. I hear it over and over and over. Dave, I, I heard this podcast. I downloaded all 23 episodes. Why? Because you figured out who your audience is and you gave them what they want. And then they go, oh, and you know what else they do? What am I doing right now? I'm telling you about it. Because that was an amazing podcast. I was like, holy cow, I don't believe it. So identify who it is. And part of that, here's the hard part. That means if I do it just for a certain people, that means these people aren't going to like it. Uh-huh. That's okay. Because this is your audience, and they can go listen to this other show. Because if you try to be everything to everybody, you're just going to be nothing to nobody. It just, it just doesn't work that way. And that's where you have to have kind of the confidence or a little bit of thick skin to, to be able to go, you know what, you don't like my show, that's okay. There's another you know, 5,000 over here you can check out because I want to talk about this. And this is what my passion is. So identify who your audience is. And then go where they are. And this is where, um, as much as it would be great to just grow your audience from the couch, it just doesn't work. And part of that is 
the best way to connect with somebody, right, is what? Face to face, eye to eye. And so I interviewed a guy, he's, a, he's now in the Hall of Fame, his name's Danny Pena, and he does a show about uh, video games, makes a living. Well, actually, he, he has a job that he got through his podcast. I think he's on the Discovery Channel, but he's like a god in the gaming industry. Um, and he would go, when a new game came out, these gaming places would like, you know, come by, you know, Mortal Kombat 30 or whatever it was. I'm so not a gamer. And, um, you know, oh, we're opening at midnight to give you the, the thing. And so you'd have all these people lined up out the streets. And Danny would walk by with business cards and say, oh, I'm, I'm Godfrey from the, the Gamer Tag Radio. And just and talk about their show. He also does not leave home without a recorder. And he would interview the people in line. Now, here's the fun thing. Uh, we're all a little vain. We all like ourselves just a little bit. And so he'd say, yeah, if you want to hear your interview, tune into my show. Um, and it worked. And so they tell two friends, and they tell two friends, and they told two friends, et cetera, et cetera. So he went to where his audience was, made friends with them in line, and then uh, uh, you know, told them about his podcast. So that's really the third step, make friends. And this is a hard one. Oh, is it hard? I never will forget, before the days of Facebook, God, that makes me sound old, they used to have these bulletin boards. And I remember I found this bulletin board, and it was filled with X radio DJs. And I was like, oh, I have found, this is my, these are people that I know would love to have a podcast. They want to get back on that. I have five hit gold. And I walked in and said, hey, guys, I'm so glad to be here. Go listen to my podcast. And they went, who is this spamming fool? Get him out. And I was banned instantly. You got to make friends because they don't care. They don't know who you are and they don't care about what you say. So you have to make the relationship. And it's so hard because we want to skip this because we can see the pot of gold. Oh, my gosh, you're my target audience. I've been looking for you my entire life. They don't care. They don't know who you are yet. So you go in, you bring value to every conversation. And then when they say, you know, I don't know, I was thinking about going with SoundCloud. I don't know. I'm not sure my media host is. And I go, oh, I actually did a whole post on this over at my website. I did it in my podcast. And they go, you have a podcast? And depending on who your audience is, they'll either go, what's a podcast? Or they'll go, where can I find it? You give them a link. So it's your value that you gave them in the conversation that leads them to wanting more. Then they find your podcast. And you're like, man, that was awesome. I can't believe you reviewed all those different stuff. I downloaded your entire back catalog. And then they tell two friends, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends. So figure out who your audience is, go to where they are, and then make friends with them. And then I've already stolen the next one. Then you tell them about your show. Now, this is not a new marketing strategy, uh, and I don't want to get all preachy on you, but it's just, I'm just going to state facts here. If you go back to the Bible, this is how Jesus did his whole thing. He would go, he would walk to where his audience was, right? He would then find somebody, and he wouldn't walk up and go, let me tell you about my God. You know, he's like, oh, and make friends with him. And then he'd say, well, let me tell you about, you know, and then he'd start his whole story. So, and if you look at different marketing places, um, Paps Blue Ribbon. Have you guys heard about this? They're like really big with like, I guess like millennials? Mill like the young people. No, 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 I know that. Oh, Paps Blue Ribbon. Yeah, that's... And they went, they basically just went to where they were in all these different events and made friends with them. And, you know, and I, cause I heard this and I'm like, wait, did you say Paps Blue Ribbon? Cause to me, Paps is the sound you make after you drink it. You're like, it's like, not a big fan. But they went to where that, their audience was uh, hung out with them, made friends, and now they're like uh, one of the top brands of that kind of, and I was like, really? are we, Pabst Blue Ribbon, are you sure you're right? But of course they had to be cool, so they're PBR, because you know, Americans can't handle three words. So <laughs> you, if you don't believe me, look at Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, is KFC, anything with three words, it's just, it's too much. So then you tell them about your show. And the fun part of that is, we all want it to happen like tomorrow. Like, can I get like a thousand downloads by tomorrow? If you run into a room with a thousand people and you talk really fast, and that's where we say it's a slow burn. But the more, it's kind of like rolling a snowball. It, there is a snowball effect because once you get their audience starts, you know, they start telling their friends and they start telling their friends and they start telling their friends. It does grow, and that's where we say you have to start with the subject you're passionate about. 
it's kind of an overused word. Everybody's like, oh, the passion word. But it's true because when you first start out, you don't really have an audience yet. Yes, your mom loves it. She thinks it's great, but you know, mom is not a good audience. But um, eventually it will start growing, and then you'll grow and grow and grow. Um, some things you want to do. Make it easy to share your show. And so this is my actual link to the School of Podcasting and iTunes. It's really easy to remember. It's just itunes.apple.com slash us slash podcast. So what I did is um, you can use bit.ly, bit.ly, bit.ly if you want to do this. Now I have a WordPress site and there's a plugin called Pretty Link because it makes, oddly enough, pretty links. So if you go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash iTunes, it takes you right to my page where you can click on subscribe and off you go. So you can make it easy because here's the thing. I, uh, I showed you my wall this morning. I think, no, it's not in this presentation. But I asked my, my audience to send in pictures where they listen. And a lot of them are in the car. They're out mowing the lawn. They're out whatever. They're not sitting in, you know, I think I have like four or five that are sitting in front of a computer because they're at work. But the fun part is if you're out mowing the lawn and you say, yeah, just go to, you know, whatever, um, they're probably not going to remember. But if you can give them something a little easier to remember and you say it over and over in every single episode, eventually they're going to remember, oh, yeah, schoolofpodcasting.com slash iTunes. I got it, got it, got it, got it. And then they'll go back and they'll subscribe. Um, make friends with your competition. And this is where you're like, shut your mouth. What are you talking about? I grew up on Howard Stern. He would devour his competition and have a funeral for them. That's because Howard Stern was on at the same time as his competition. And this is a weird thing to say. It makes me sound like an egomaniac. There is no competition in podcasting. It's because there isn't any competition because my quote competition is uh, Daniel J. Lewis from the Audacity to Podcast. It's Ray Ortega from uh, podcasterstudio.com. It's uh, The Feed uh, with Rob and Elsie. It's She Podcast with Elsie and Jessica. Why aren't these people my, uh, my uh, competition? Because they're not on the same time I am. There is no time in podcasting. It's timeless. So you can listen to me on Monday. You can listen to Elsie and Jessica on Tuesday. You can listen to Rob on Wednesday. You can listen to Daniel on Thursday. And heck, even if you run out of time during the week, it's still there. It's a time-shifted conversation. And one of the things, I was a podcast movement, and uh, Ray Ortega um, came up to me and he said, man, I, I love your show. I, I used to listen. I worked in a grocery store, and I used to listen with one earbud in. And he said, and I just would listen to your show the whole time while I was working. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. I appreciate that. And we became friends. And then later, he wanted to start a show on Google Hangout. And so he got myself and my other quote competition, Daniel J. Lewis, to be co-host. And I get so many people that have found my show, not through a Google search, but because they found the Podcasters Roundtable, which is the name of that show. And they're like, yeah, I really like it. And you always, here's that word again, seem to bring value and you seem to do, you know, like you seem to be kind of sarcastic and snarky, and I like that. I identify with the snark. I like that you bring the snark. And I'm like, all right, well, cool. And they come and listen to my show. And consequently, what did I just do? I just talked about Daniel J. Lewis and Ray Ortega. So we're constantly referring to each other. Um, uh, a friend of mine um, has deemed us the tripods because it's three guys, and I'm like, okay, I get it. But it is something that you might want to think about because there's more than, you know, it's not competition. You can listen to my show and then listen to their show, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing that if you cut your competition out, these are some of my best friends now. Why? Because they love the same stuff I do. They, I mean, we completely, the best thing of the podcasters round table is when we hit stop on the record button and we talk like behind the scenes stuff. Oh, that's where the, we should record that. That's really the show. And so that's the best part. So, um, and if I didn't do that, I, I would have friends that, I wouldn't have those guys as friends, and they're really, really cool. Uh, Daniel J. Lewis and I, occasionally we get on the phone, um, he's just a great guy, and we connect on so many levels. But if I said, well, I can't be friends with him, because, well, he's trying to steal my listeners. Nah. So, get your family involved. Um, this is something I, I didn't do for a while, and then my sister-in-law finally said, do you have any business cards? And I'm like, well, yeah. And she's like, I'm always having people, and they'll, somebody will hear something about a podcast, and I'll say, oh, my brother-in-law does this whole podcasting thing. And she goes, and then they'll ask me about it, and she's like, it would be so much better if I could just give them a business card. And so I did, and I was amazed at how many people I got as clients 
that came, like my sister-in-law, she'd get like a commission because she's always referring people my way because she's a teacher. She teaches in um, the Akron Public Schools. So she's always running into teachers that want to start a podcast for their class or they're gonna do things like that. So you never know who your family's gonna run into. So give them a, a tool. And the, the beautiful thing about a business card is they cost almost nothing. I mean, like per, like whatever, it's like a nickel or two cents a card. Um, and so a lot of times, if, I, if somebody asks me for a card, I will give them two because birds of a feather flock together. And if you like my show, I'm pretty sure you probably know somebody else who would as well. And I know it's an extra two cents out the door, but you'll be amazed at how that works. Um, my first podcast that I did was for musicians. Uh, I actually play the guitar. And you kind of have to know who your audience is. And again, you have to know where they are. And so this is way back uh, in like 2005. And so I knew musicians would go to Guitar Center. So I put about, I made little snippets again, just of like the best hitting points that made people go, wow, I want to hear more about this. And I burned them onto a CD. And I had, uh, I had a CD that would actually print on the CD. And it was like free music marketing tips. And then it had my logo, had my website, and then here's where you can subscribe in iTunes. And it was cool because I'd drop off like 10 or 15 CDs and I'd go back the next week and they'd be gone. And I asked the guy, I'm like, are you guys throwing these away? And they're like, no, throwing what away? They didn't even know I was doing it. And so it was actual people that were taking it. And so uh, it doesn't hurt in some cases to kind of go offline to do your, your promotion. I did the same thing. I had the CDs out front, but I also took a, I did a Microsoft Word document, same thing, free music marketing tips, get more people to your concerts, yada, 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 sell more CDs. So all these ways of how they're gonna benefit. And at the bottom, instead of having a phone number, you know, like when you sell stuff, it was just my website. And then the key to this, if you try this one, it's amazing how this works. I tested this at a college, tear off one of the tabs. Because if somebody sees a bunch of things on a, on a bulletin board and one of them has a tab missing, it's perceived value. Well, this must be good because somebody took one. And I tested this uh, at a college and it was amazing. I had two different bulletin boards in the exact same room and I just tore off one and I went back like a week later and there were a bunch missing from this one and almost none from that one. It was like, wow, it's that whole perceived value thing. So those are some ways you can, can um, kind of promote your show offline. Uh, I used to do, uh, I was a corporate trainer, so I traveled all over the place to, to do training. And if I was bored in a hotel, I would go to the local Barnes & Noble and basically spam their, their books. I would find books on either podcasting or I had a show on weight loss and I had business cards for everyone. And I would just go in and I would go on page 42 because at the time that's how old I was and I would put a business card in that. I don't know if that's a great strategy, but if you're bored and have nothing else to do, um, that would do. If you do this, um, you'll see if I have a card here for the School of Podcasting, and you'll see that I have a, a coupon on that. Um, you might want to set up a special website, like yourwebsite.com slash card, and maybe have a video there. It's like, hey, obviously you've gotten a business card from me. Thanks for coming. Let me tell you about the show. And right down there is where you can subscribe to it, um, just so you can see what kind of return you're getting on your, your business cards. Things like that. Anything like that, they'll personalize it. Educate your audience. Um, I mentioned this morning there's a guy named Glenn Hebert who does a show, he does a number of shows, but if you go to horseradionetwork.com, he has a whole network of podcasts that talk about horses and horses and horses. He has over 20 sponsors now, and one of the things he realized is his audience, horse people, not exactly the geekiest people on the planet. And he knew this. He's like, look, they're just, that's just not the way it works. So what he did was, I, I don't know that it's quite as in your face as it used to be because he just redid his website. But he had lots of buttons like learn how to listen. You know, click here and it was like, hey, here's all you have to do. Click here and click on the play button. Um, if you have a, an iPhone, click here and he had screenshots showing people how to subscribe to your show. Um, if you're on Android and he had more screenshots, do this. You know, if neither of one of these, sign up for our email list and we will email you a link to the, fi to the file. So he just knew his audience wasn't that geeky. And so he spent a lot of time educating them on here's how you can consume my stuff. Um, while we're talking Glenn the Geek, it doesn't have to do with educating, but it is a cool little strategy. Uh, what he did is he went to magazines or anybody like a, a leader or a an influencer maybe in your niche, whatever it is. And like he went to this one, he's like, would you be interested in advertising on a show? Which they did, 
but he also said, I'm going to give you code to put on your website to promote, you know, because your, your audience, horse people, would like my show. And so he did that as well, which was great because the advertiser was helping to promote his show. His show was promoting the advertiser, and it just kind of created this whole snowball thing. And then he could go to other advertisers and say, look, I have this many downloads, part of them coming from other advertisers. So he just got away, and he built that uh, through relationships again, of getting to know his sponsors. He has them really get involved with his show. Like if he has a question about a saddle, he goes to the saddle manufacturer, brings them onto the show to answer the question, positions that advertiser as an expert, which they kind of are, um, without it being, let me just talk about saddles and how good they are. So it's a way to get their, their advertiser involved without it just being another 30 second commercial. He uses them as, as uh, subject matter experts. So, but depending on who your audience is, you might need to make it super easy to uh, you know, teach them how to, to subscribe because that's where, that's really what you want. You will hear people talk about ratings and reviews. And there's been a few people that have done some tests. The bottom line is when you do a search, one of the things in iTunes, one of the things that helps your rankings is how many subscribers you have. And people love to leave ratings and reviews and things like that. But in the end, the, the real goal is getting them to subscribe. Um, so let's talk about things that don't work. Speaking of ratings and reviews, um, this one drives me crazy. I, I was in a Facebook group, and somebody said, hey, let's get a good old-fashioned review swap going. And I've heard of these. I thought it was like a unicorn. I was like, I've heard of these, but I've never seen one. And all of a sudden, I mean, right before my eyes, it was like, here's my show, here's my show, here's my show. And it, the whole idea is I'm going to ask complete strangers who have never listened to my show to please go give me a five-star rating, and I'll do the same for you. So you'll see this if you go into somebody's iTunes, and it's just like five stars, great show. That's usually like the number one review. Great show, awesome show, because they're too busy to, you know, they're, they're waiting to run back and see if they reviewed them. And what this does, number one, reviews really don't play that much into iTunes as much as, as people thought. Um, but the other thing is, if you can't get your own audience to review your show, maybe it's time to go back and make sure you're giving them what they want. Because if you're not delivering any value, you're not, it's, it's this thing called a law of reciprocity. When you do something nice for somebody and you help them out, they feel kind of indebted to do something nice for you. So when you make it easy and you say, go to school podcasting.com slash iTunes and leave a rating and review, they're more inclined to do that. So when you're asking complete strangers, I'm like, maybe I need to go back and look at your content. But what this does is, does anybody remember David Cook? Anybody? Anybody remember the name? David Cook was a big celebrity. Anybody know him? David Cook. He's a singer. There you go. You win. What does she win? It's a cheese straightener. He's the winner of the eighth season of American Idol. But at the time, if, if this was the day of... Exactly. So what's my point of this? Let's say they did. Let's say ratings and reviews just shot you up the charts, which they don't. But what if it did? Okay, we shoot people up to the top of the charts like David Cook, who I'm sure is a nice person and a very talented singer. But he's not exactly a household name now, is he? Even though he was at the top of the charts, he was on TV every single week. Because in some cases, these guys don't, you know, they're, we used to call it paying your dues in the music business. You know, you get to the top of the charts, but if you don't really have that talent to then um, keep you there, it just doesn't work. So review swaps do not work. I'm gonna throw another one in here. I don't remember, I don't think I made a, a slide for this one. You'll hear, it's not as much as it used to be. There's this thing called Twitter bombing. And this is where people would get, I don't know, six or seven, they'd make a bunch of fake Twitter accounts. And literally, there's these different tools you can use to schedule hundreds of tweets per hour. And it's all linking to, so, so I call it shotgun marketing. Where it's like, click here to listen. And they'd even put things that didn't, you know, look here, it's you know, naked pictures of whatever, and then it's a link to your MP3 file anything to get them to click because what they were doing is they wanted to be able to go to their advertiser and go, look, we've got 10,000 downloads per episode. Now, you know, 9,950 of those are to people clicking things that they don't know what they're clicking, but whatever. Um, but that has kind of been, A, kiboshed because Lipson was able to go in and as were other media hosts to kind of see the trend and able to just say, knock it off. 
but it doesn't work. Because what happens, let's, let's say we go that route. Look at me, I have 10,000 downloads per episode. Mr. Sponsor, give me your money. Oh, here's your check. Well, the problem is you don't really have 10,000 downloads. You have whatever, 500. Well, the sponsor's waiting for the results of, you know, let's say we get 10%, we should have 1,000 people interested in our product. Well, you don't because you really have 500 and maybe 10% of those is 50. And now what they do, and this is why this killed me, not only do they say, I'm never advertising on your show again, they go to their friends and go, don't spend any money in podcasting because, man, that's pfft, no return on investment. And that's when it really made me upset. I'm like, look, if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, fine, but you're also shooting podcasting in the foot. So um, here's another thing that doesn't work. The Dave Jackson Hour. I've seen people do this. The bad news is they don't have an hour's worth of material. So there's a great quote by, uh, there's a book called Beyond Powerful Radio. And the woman's name is Valerie Geller. One of my favorite quotes of all time says, um, there is no such thing as too boring. Um, or I'm sorry, let's back that up. There is no such thing as too long, only too boring. And I'll give you an example. I have, uh, well, number one, there's a guy named Dan Carlin. His shows do like, they're like three, four hours long. Um, he breaks every rule there is in podcasting. He doesn't, he doesn't produce on a regular, consistent basis. His shows are like four hours long, and when they come out, they get hundreds of thousands of downloads in 24 hours. It's amazing. Why? Because it's content that you can't get anyplace else. It's amazing. Um, I had a client. Her name is Judy Graff. She does The Farm and Wife, and she sent me her first episode in and said, Dave, look, you know, if you get a chance, listen to this and tell me what you think. And I listened to it, and it's all this farming stuff. Well, I'm not a farmer, so I'm kind of like, yeah, I guess it's good. You, know, you might want to get a test market of farmers to listen to that. And uh, I said, you, you do know the file you sent me was three hours long, right? And she goes, I know, they're saying it's too short. And I was like, too short? And she goes, well, yeah, my target audience sits on a tractor for eight hours a day. They're bored out of their gourd. And because um, I actually know somebody who drives it, you literally, it's kind of robotic. You basically line it up, you hit a button and the tractor keeps itself straight. And so you ride for an acre and a half and then you finally hit a button and do the turn, and then you put it back on. So you're bored out of your gorge. She goes, yeah, my audience is like, make it longer. So there is no such thing as too long, only too boring. So I know a lot of people, you'll hear like, the average commute in America is 20 minutes. So people think they have to make a 20 minute show. That's awesome if you have 20 minutes of material. I can save you so much time right now. If you hear a podcast start off with, well, welcome to the show today. And, uh, you know, I've always promised that I'm going to give you a show every Thursday. I'm not really sure what I'm going to talk about today, but I'm making my promise. Tune out right now because they're going to waste whatever 45 minutes of your life that they've just said. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And if you've ever been – I've been to Chicago, and I saw Second City. Have you ever heard about Second City? It's like one of the best improv groups ever, right? I mean, all of Saturday Night Live, a lot of them came from there. They weren't that good. Improv is – it, when it's good, it's really good. But there were a couple that were like, man, that Superman sketch was not, ew, okay. Um, I mean, it was okay. And when they were funny, they were really funny. But sometimes just making it up off the cuff, that's what's fun about it, is you don't know what's going to happen. But in some cases, you're like, hey, hey, we all learned that that didn't work. So um, that whole thing doesn't work. So if you have 15 minutes worth of material, do a 15-minute podcast. Um, it's just because this, this is, ugh, I've heard this before. And the other thing is, I think it's funny, if you're going to do a show called the Dave Jackson Hour, which I don't, that's a made-up name, make sure it's an hour long, because I had somebody review the show, and it was 90 minutes long, and I'm like, I just need to state the obvious. Uh, you said it was an hour long, it was 90 minutes. Uh, it goes back to that whole editing thing we we're talking about. So yeah, when you have 50 minutes of content, do, do not do an hour-long show. Um, build it, and they will come. This is the whole thing of, if I can just get into iTunes. Oh, you know what? I'll go into Stitcher and Google Play Music. Oh, you know what? And that whole Amazon thing that you talk to, that looks up podcasts on TuneIn. If I just get in all those, you know, I will be on Jimmy Fallon in no time. Right? I'm just going to be rich and famous. And this is why a lot of podcasters don't make it past episode seven, because they've done this. They're waiting for, you know, manna from heaven. And it's just like, well, you know, I have, and that's where they, I always say, well, I've only got 70 downloads after three weeks. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's three classrooms of people that are choosing to listen to you. Um, you have to tell people about your show. It's, you know, are you famous because you're in the phone book? I'm in the phone book. Are you in the phone book? 
I'm not on Jimmy Fallon yet, though. And that's really all iTunes is. It's a phone book for people to go and find their podcast. And, and think about that. Uh, do you guys remember? I'm so da- – I feel like I'm 900 years old in this. Do you guys remember when you used to have a little phone book that you would put your, like, your family's phone book in? And it would sit next to the phone, right? You remember that? It's the same thing. You have the big phone book. That's iTunes. And then you have your own personal little phone book now called, you know, the podcast app where you put the, just the numbers you want, or in this case, just the podcast you want on your phone. So it's the same thing. It's just, it's all, it's all digital now. So, uh, so yeah, being in iTunes is not going to make you famous. Um, it will definitely help. Don't, don't, you know, I, I love Apple stuff. I'm so happy they got involved with podcasting, but it's just, you know, I don't want to pop your bubble, but getting in iTunes is not going to make you famous. Um, and that's it. Okay. That's my last slide. So any questions? We've got um, about 10 minutes. That's perfect. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to uh, answer those. So yes? Uh, going back to the beginning, a couple questions. So in terms of uh, the title mm-hmm. of both podcast and of episodes. So first question, do you have a suggested like, minimum, maximum length? No. Or just put, a description. put it at the end if you're going to put it in. Yes, Nobody yes. cares that it's episode number 16. You could, because some people want it there so you can search for it. So you can say it's in episode number 16. Okay, okay. well then put it in the description somewhere. Okay. Um, in some cases, I've seen people do this. Like this podcast originated from yourwebsite.com slash whatever. It's episode 16. Because in some cases, people will take your RSS feed and basically put your stuff on their stuff which on one hand is kind of like, eh, um, but on the other hand, it's still a play and somebody might find it, but it, that doesn't happen as much as it used to. But yeah, um, in terms of length, I would have to go do a Google search and count how many numbers, how many letters there are. Usually for me, I just try to keep it somewhat short. Um, so, and, and just obvious, you know, the, the three things that you need that blah, blah, blah. And, and just think about, your target audience sitting in front of your podcast, what is going to make them click play? You know, Are for you talking episode title or, or the podcast title? Podcast title, make it painfully obvious, is my recommendation. Uh, you don't have to do that, but you know, I, I've heard of numerous, well, not numerous, a few shows, like five to ten, that have gone with the cool inside baseball kind of name that, you know, the, the super nerds of this TV show or the super nerds of the sport would know it. But the problem is nobody's searching for that. You have, to, you have to go play in traffic. What are people searching for? That's why my show is called The School of Podcasting, because people know what it is. I have one show called Logical Weight Loss. I have another show called Weekly Web Tools. Anybody want to guess what these are about? Um, you know, um, I have one called Feeding My Faith. I have another one called, now I have one that is a little weird. It's called Building a Better Dave. But that's just when I run out of things to talk about on these other shows. And I'm like, oh, this doesn't fit that show, that show, or that show. This is just Dave being weird and talking about whatever he wants, which is almost not a real podcast. I shouldn't even mention that one. But that is just me talking. But in terms of length of that name of the podcast, mm-hmm. three words? Less? As long as it needs to be, and, and if it needs to be, um, I Hate Tribbles, a you know, Star Trek podcast, blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever it needs to be. But think of a headline. You don't, want to, it should, you don't want it to be a paragraph, but something that rolls off the tongue. Uh, when we're talking about names, rolls off the tongue. For a while, my brother came back from um, Florida. He'd been to Disneyland, and they talked about fast passes. And I said, I'm going to name my, my consulting service that. I will be Podcast Fast Pass. And then I had to go around saying Podcast Fast Pass. Because people are like, what's the name of it? I'm like, no. So that changed to podcast mechanic, which kind of, I think I still have that somewhere. Um, so make sure it's easy to say. Make sure it's easy to spell. So when you say things like um, kidsexpert.com, you need to watch that because you said kids expert, and when you look at that, it says kid sexpert. So be careful about what it looks like when you pick a name. Um, don't name, do a quick Google search because I don't think it would make much sense for me to name my show, um, 
I don't know, uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, because I think that name's been used before. Um, and I don't like trademark lawsuits, so uh, things of that nature. And then just, and what you can do again, get a focus group. I'm thinking of calling it, here's my five choices. Da, 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 da. And which one do you like, focus group? And they go, oh, no, no, I like this one. It, it seems to, you know, go with that. And you can always change it later, by the way. Is, is there a, a too wrong one? If there is, I haven't found it. Uh, probably, I would go into, and this is where you have to go into iTunes and look at a name and see if there's any that are cut off. But I, I would keep it shorter than simple because, again, SpaghettiOs, Paps Blue Ribbon. It's not Paps Blue Ribbon something, 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 something beer. Because you want people to remember it. You don't want them to go, let me tell you about my favorite podcast. <gasps> Super catch of fragilization case, SB Alidocious. That's not going to work. So, All right, in the back, I saw you hand them. Mm -hmm. So it said, oh, you can hear my interview on the Unstoppable podcast. So I go on my podcast, Attic, which is my player, mm -hmm. and there were four different Unstoppable podcasts. They were all called Unstoppable wow. podcasts with different people. So I didn't know where that interview was. You know, one was like seven years ago. Was the last nice. Time. Well, yeah, to me, depending on the scenario, I, to, I'm like, okay, this has already been used. There's got to be another way to describe my show. Like, are you going to tell me that's the only word that was available? Like, if somebody says, I'm going to call my show the School of Podcasting, you'll get an email from me going, okay, this is me being nice. This is used. It's trademarked. Take it down or I'm going to go find some legal people and things are going to get expensive real quick. Um, so... Yeah, you could, you know, and then you might want to contact those people, even though they faded, to say, hey, I'm thinking of starting a new show, because they might have some sort of legal tie to that name. Obviously not, if, if they do, they're not enforcing it, which is part of the problem. Um, but it's, yeah, I know there are a bunch of, uh, can I, oh, here's another tip. Adding the word on fire to your name will not get you 10,000 downloads. There's a guy named John Lee Dumas. He's the Energizer Bunny of, of podcasting, makes millions of dollars a year, really nice guy. And everybody thought, if I just do a daily show and call it Librarians on Fire um, or whatever, I will make a million. I, I'm just going to follow his recipe. And I would say, if, that was the, if it was that easy, just following the recipe, I'm going to grow my hair, put on some suits, get four guys. We're going to call ourselves the Meatles, right? And I'm sure we'll just get claim. It, it doesn't you got to have talent. you got to have your own injection, things like that. So be, I just please don't name your show on fire because there are some of us that just throw up in our mouth just a little bit when we see that now. Um, but with that one, yeah, I, I mean, I personally would contact those guys just because I, I, if you've ever had anything dealing with the legal system, you try to stay out of it at all cost. So I would contact those guys. And then I would also ask myself, is there not another word I could use? But I've seen shows that have the the same name. Crystal, do you know of any off the top of your head? The Feed. Oh, The Feed. That's true. There's another show called The Feed. It's about cooking. And uh, Libsyn show, The Feed, is about The Feed, as in the RSS feed. Ours was first. And they took it. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's kind of a hassle. But that's a great question. Any, yes? Yeah, there's, um, the cool thing is, if somebody, here's a great way to grow your audience. If somebody asks you, um, what's a podcast? Go, do you have a smartphone? And they go, yeah, what do you got? And you go, an iPhone. You're like, oh, cool. Uh, pretty much, 99 point, I think you can delete it now, but most people don't. There's a purple app called Podcasts with an S. And you go, oh, let me show you here. So you go, podcasts are a little bit like internet radio shows. Except you can listen to them whenever you want. You don't have to like turn it on at three. And like, what's your favorite? Like, what's your hobby? And you go, oh, I don't know. I like. And then you go, do you have a signal here? Do you have a signal? No, you don't have a signal here. I don't have a signal here. But anyway, and then I would look up whatever. Oh, you like NASCAR? Cool, NASCAR podcast search. And I'm like, and you can just subscribe to this like that. And like, then you go and like, my show is the so and so. And then you put your show in and subscribe to it. Um, but yeah, the the podcast app. I use one. It's um, 
Uh, he used pocket cash. That's a really popular one. There is a pocket cast. On iOS, I use one called uh, Overcast, which is kind of handy. It's a lot like Pocket Cast where you can, um, I can listen on my phone, I can listen on my iPod, I can listen on their website, and it just picks up where I left off, which is kind of cool. There's Stitcher, there's a bunch. Pocket, the, the podcast app from uh, Apple is probably the most popular one, but um, there are more and more coming out every day, yes? Well, the good news is a lot of the players, like I believe Pocket Cast actually basically goes to the back end of iTunes and sucks all the information out and puts it in their player. So if you're in iTunes, you're already in Pocket Cast. Um, I think it's the same thing with Overcast. Most of these just pull from iTunes. Um, Stitcher does not, um, so you have to go over and list it in Stitcher. TuneIn doesn't, so you have to go listen on TuneIn. Um, and if you just Google director, uh, podcast directories, there's a bunch of them out there. You can list them. It, most of those are, are just, well, they all are. You put in what's called your RSS feed, which is kind of like if this was radio, it's like saying tune in to 98.5 and never, ever, ever tune out. So you just copy this code, put it into this thing, and it just, it's there. And then when somebody goes, oh, I want to subscribe, it goes, oh, Dave's on 98.5, and they get that that way. But it's one and done. So when you list yourself at Stitcher, you go in, post it, type some stuff in, hit save, you're done. You go to tune in, you put your stuff in there, hit save, you're done. Oh, so you don't put every episode in there. No, because it's, what it is, here's another, now, I'm, I, I love analogies if you haven't figured this out. An analogy for, for an RSS feed, and this again, man, I'm just old. Do you guys remember recipe boxes, like your mom's recipe box? Right, you had a little box, you'd open it up and there'd be all these recipes in there. When you submit your show to a directory, they are, um, looking at the location of your recipe box. And when people then open your recipe box, there are all your episodes. So you just say, here's my recipe box. And then every time you put a new recipe in that box, it shows up over there because that thing's looking at your recipe box. So it, it's one and done. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, right. Bless you, my son. This is a great question. When you, what, a great way to grow your downloads is to make it easy. Because again, some people don't. I don't. I don't use iTunes. Make sure when you go to your website, you have a big button that says "Play" somewhere that they don't have to search for or click through. Because again, people don't read. So if you can go, go to website, click play is kind of the goal. Um, and if somebody isn't doing that, shame on them. But it, it, that happens a lot, unfortunately. And some WordPress themes make you have to click read more till you see the play button, things like that. But if you can make it, go to website, click play. Because I have a website where it's one of those themes where if, if I wanted to go in, I could configure the code. But it's one where you'd have to say read more. Well, I configured a player to be on the sidebar. So you go to website and click play over here and at least get some going that way. So, any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned pretty URL. Pretty Link is a WordPress, yeah, is a uh, free plugin. They also have a, a premium version that allows you to make things like schoolpodcasting.com slash iTunes, your website.com slash, um, like I have one, um, there's a, a website called Patreon where people, if they want, can basically pledge to give you money every month because doggone it, you deliver value. And so uh, I have a show that I do every Saturday called Ask the Podcast Coach. And so my pretty link is askthepodcastcoach.com slash awesome. Because if you want to be an awesome supporter, just go to askthepodcastcoach.com slash awesome and sign up today. And then I give them extra content and bonus stuff and things like that. So that's just basically what that link does. And you can do things like Bitly. Bitly is fine, but to me, A, if I have it tied into my website, whatever it may be, I, it's another chance for me to say my website name, which just starts to, you know, beat it into their head, schoolofpodcasting.com. So that's why I use that one. So the plugin just adds a backslash and then Yeah, you, 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 you give it the really ugly link, and then you give it a word that's going to be the yourwebsite.com slash, and then whatever you put there is going to be the, the link. You can hand that one out. 
Yeah. So, like, I, my last episode was episode number 526. So if you go to schoolpodcasting.com slash 526, that's my episode. But you created that. With Pretty Link. Yeah, so I took my ugly link and then put it in there and said, make it 526. So I still have the old link, which has keywords in it, which I want for Google juice, but I have another link that points to the, uh, the not ugly, the longer link that nobody would ever remember. Yeah, yes. You can start with one. Uh, I have somebody who went very high, again, not that it's a big deal, but they went very high into new and noteworthy with one. Why? Because they had a, a, they had a pre-made email list and they sent them to a page with instructions on how to subscribe. And she just went right up the charts. The, the theory is that some of the things that make you rank up high in iTunes is the total number of downloads. So if somebody likes your show, they hear that first episode, if you give them more to, to listen to, they might go back and do that. They also might not. And so here's my thing. iTunes will always have your last episode at the top. It's just the way it works. So let's say I put it out with three episodes. Okay, great. And you listen to episode number three, and you're like, okay, I'll have to wait till the next show. You don't say, hey, download all of these. Well, that means I put a lot of effort into episode one and two that's just going, mm. now, now I am surprised how many people do go back and, and listen to the previous episodes. Um, so, Crystal, do you have an opinion on this? I just always tell people you don't need 15 and 13 and 25. I get the concept, but I've also seen people get right to the top with one. You have to have one, yeah. The, the myth of that one is when people subscribe to your podcast, it does not automatically download your entire back catalog. It downloads the last episode. And then they have to go in and say, get, 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 get. If they're on the desktop version of iTunes, you can right click and say, get all, and it downloads them all. That's awesome. The bad news is 70% of people now are using their phone, not the desktop version of iTunes. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, the thing I hate to see is um, people will spend months agonizing over creating the perfect launch. And it just, um, there's a, a, it's a Lipson competitor, super nice guy. His name's Rob Greenlee. He started a show called Spreaker Live. And I love it now because if you listen, he's on about episode 30. And this is a guy that's been doing this for really longer than 10 years because he did like internet radio before that and you can hear him go through kind of his almost like thinking out loud of how he started one way with his podcast and then he started doing guests and then he did this and now he has a co-host and he's kind of really found his voice now about episode 30 um, and not that episode 1 through 29 were bad um, they're actually really good but sometimes you just don't know until you start getting that feedback um, and so if you put out a bunch all at once, and then somebody goes, oh, it's too short, and you're like, oh, I have 15 episodes that are 12 minutes long, now what do you do? So, um, but we're, technically we're, we're late. I know there's another session. If you want to go to that, that's fine. If you guys have more questions, I'll be more happy to answer them, but don't, if you want to, I know, I know there's another, I think there's another two sessions going on, but if you'd rather sit here and ask questions for me, uh, I will answer them. If you want to leave, I'm not offended. Yeah. In terms of finding your, your audience and finding your niche, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, but you don't want to be too wide, but you don't want to be so niche that there's not an audience there. I mean, the Why are you getting into podcasting? That's, That's the big question. question. If you can't answer that question, by the way, don't, don't start. Because <laughs> if you can't answer why, you'll never, ever make it through the how. Uh, and it might be, um, you know, it, for me, I started the Logic Weight Loss podcast because I wanted to document my weight loss. 
I didn't also think it was going to document my weight gain and my weight loss and my weight gain and my weight loss, but it did. Um, but the funny thing is, I've inspired people to lose weight through my failure, which is really bizarre. Because I had people, I love this show, this guy's just like me, I'm down 30 pounds. Because I gained weight, okay, fine. I mean, now I'm down 30 pounds, I'm happy with that. Um, but I didn't start that show to make money. I didn't start that to sell stuff. I just did that because I'm like, if I talk about this publicly, I'll stay away from the Cheetos. And it didn't work. Um, but, so that's why I started that show. Um, I started the School of Podcasting because it's, it didn't work. Yeah. Well, it did. I, I stay away from the Cheetos and the Mountain Dew. I finally kicked a really bad Mountain Dew habit. Um, I started the School of Podcasting because it scratches every itch I have. I get to be creative, I get to be kind of geeky, and I get to help people. That's when I found podcasting. I'm like, this is it. This is what I was called to do. So, um, weekly web tools. I, I used to help people build websites, so it's just kind of another thing I was passionate about. So, be careful with that, too, because once you start one, you're like, ooh, I could start another podcast, another podcast. And there's still only 24 hours in a day. And so, I ended up, I think my record, I had seven going at one time. And the bad news is they were seven extremely bland podcasts because I, instead of really digging deep into a subject, I didn't have enough time. And I finally was like, okay, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go. And uh, so, yeah. You have a topic you're passionate about, like a natural podcast topic. Yes. It depends, really. I'll give you an example. Uh, Nick Suberling was going to do a show about the NFL. And then he was like, you know what? Maybe we'll just do about the Eastern Conference. And they said, you know what? Really, my favorite team is the Bengals. So he just did a show about the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, the people that found that were like, oh, my God, I love the Bengals. And so he did that show for about seven years, um, had a nice long run with it. And here's the cool thing. He finally said, you know, I, I think I've said about all there is to it. Not that I hate the Bengals anymore, but I'm really getting into the soccer thing. And he just shut it down. And nobody punched him in the face. So it's a beautiful thing. I think he's going to keep it live. Because if you, um, let's say I cancel my Lipson account, well, eventually your files will get deleted, which will mean your RSS feed will be invalid, which means eventually iTunes will delete it. So, so what some people will do is they'll just go down to our $5 a month plan just to keep the, the files live. Because in some cases, if it's evergreen content, you can just... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to ask him. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's not... People tune in for the content. They stay for the host. You know, so if you can... Uh, I. I talked about Troy Heinrichs this morning. He did a show on a TV show that was horrible called Under the Dome. And they were praying it was going to get canceled after season two. And they came in, Under the Dome, season three, and they're like, ugh. And half the people, if you read their iTunes reviews, the show, this podcast, is more entertaining than the actual show. Because they had these things like um, one of the co-hosts, um, he had, you know, the candy whoppers. Like, the worst the show was, how many whoppers was Wayne going to have to put into his mouth to be able to tolerate the show? So they made it very entertaining, and their, their audience actually was super creative. They would call in, would, and they would actually make, a, like, a subplot line of it. It was just bizarre. So the actual people tuned in for the content of Under the Dome, but they stayed because of the host. So it's kind of weird that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I use Twitter, I use Facebook, um, I use uh, I use a tool called Buffer at BufferApp.com. So I use Google+, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and I think that's about it. I mean, there's a bunch, but the thing is there's so many social channels that I just finally said, I'm going to go to the ones that I can, because some people say be everywhere. I'm like, I will be everywhere I can be well. You know what I mean? Like. I, yeah, be present. Like, I'm really not that good at Twitter. I check Twitter like two or three times a week. I know some people that check Twitter two or three times an hour. You know, I'm just not that guy. Um, yeah. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's just, and Facebook I'm a little more up on and things like that. But I just started being spread so thin that 
again, my the value of my content was going, and I just wasn't seeing any interaction, and I was like, you know what? Social? Not that I know of. It's just a matter of, it goes back to always bringing value. Um, I know I have tuned in to people's shows that I'll see them. It's one of the things where you, you turn around and you're like, well, there they are again. They're there. So I'll go to somebody's show and I see they left a comment. And then I'm in a Facebook group and they left a comment. It was a really good comment. And then I, and all of a sudden on, there's their Twitter and they're like, a new episode. I'm like, you know, this guy always seems to, you know, this woman has great stuff when she's in the Facebook groups and in the Google Plus thing. And I'm like, click and listen, you know. And at that point, you're like, oh, I like this. Okay. And then it's a matter of subscribe. So, yeah. anybody else? If not, we'll uh, wrap. Thank you guys very much for coming. I know this was kind of a last minute add on. Uh, so, thank you very much. My, uh, my, I had a newsletter, so if we go, I mean, this is this is back back in the day. I used to use Front Page, Microsoft Front Page, to build websites, and um, I built up this this newsletter for musicians, and it was all about how to get more fans, more gigs, and and more music sales. And I started podcasting before there was podcasting. I would just take. Um, like I remember I interviewed a musician over the phone and when I listened to this I just cringe it is so bad but there were these little I forget the name of the some little flash app that I could upload the the audio file and just have a little play button there and just that is when I started to see just having tone of voice instead of having to put things in italics or bold or underline to, to stress stuff was just a, a cooler way to do that and I had people that started to send a little more feedback uh, from just, hey, I'm, I'm liking this button on the website thing. I'll, I can just click on this now and I'll listen to it at work instead of having to read the whole thing. So yeah, I had, it was about 2,000 people on the email list. And when I uh, finally turned it into a podcast was when I got the feedback from the guy from, uh, from Germany. And I was just, content, really good content. And how that started was I was going to write a book. Um, I, I, I would go to... Um, the different forums and such and I would explain like how to market your band and like we did a thing just a quick example we bought t-shirts we had six dollars in the t-shirt and we would at the end of set one we would go hey we're raffling off a t-shirt it's a dollar per ticket or you can get six for five and we would go around and just stick around and we'll announce the winner at the end and I would go out and sell thirty dollars worth of t-shirts or tickets for a $6 t-shirt. And then we would pull the winner, they would come up, we would sign the t-shirt, and I was like, this is how I made $24 profit on a $6 t-shirt. And people were like, that's really cool. So I just had all these kind of stories, and somebody said, you should write a book. And so I started writing the book, and then somebody said, well, you should start building up your list, put some of these on a website. And so it was just, again, it goes back to content, knowing who your audience was. And at the time, it was easy, because I was a musician. I was playing in a band. And so I would just put up these road stories and this and that. And then what the podcast was supposed to be was everybody sharing their stories. And musicians don't play that way, because they, they, oh, if I give you my story, then you'll be better than I am. You didn't have that collab. As much as we all collaborate on music, they're not really big on sharing their stories. Or our churches, for the record. I used to have a show called Grow Your Church Show. And I was amazed at how many people would not share, this is how we're growing our church. I'm like, really? Because aren't we all on the same team? It's kind of weird. But yeah, that's how I grew the, the list, was just, I had a website um, back before there were even blogs, uh, build in front page, and here's, here's the latest newsletter, sign up to get more, and then eventually that just led to the podcast. So. Yeah, it's, it's, and here's a great way to get people on your list, though, and I was surprised this worked. But I realized that most of my audience is out in the field mowing the lawn, walking the dog, in the car. And I said, if you've ever thought of going back to my website and you keep forgetting, 
Here's a way that you can have the website come to you. Just remember this, schoolofpodcasting.com slash newsletter. All you do is go over and sign up, and when I put out a new episode, I'll have the, set, the show notes that you're thinking I need to go back to will come right to your inbox. And I was amazed. I had like 15 people that week sign up for my newsletter because a lot of people are in that boat. They're probably thinking, oh, you know what? I was going to go back, and I forgot. So just an email newsletter. Yep. Because there's links in there that I mentioned that they're like, oh, I need to go back. And he mentioned that one pretty link thing. I need to go see where that is. Well, if you sign up for the newsletter, it's there. And then the other thing that's nice about that, there's some bonus content. But now when I do a survey, I send it out to the newsletter because they're one click away from taking it. And I'll announce it on the podcast. But I've always seen I get a better reaction from my newsletter, depending on the scenario. Yeah. I think I have a question. is It's a blog, and the email goes out every day. Okay. One of those blog posts is a pod is our weekly podcast. Mm -hmm. However, when you receive the email through Mailchimp, the what you can't play. The player's not present in Mailchimp. Is is there an effective way around that other than I know you can't listen to it, so please click here. Yeah, yeah click here to download. So click here to you know, and then you put a direct link to the MP3 file. Right. Yeah, there's that's. You can do fun things where you can put a picture of a player and then have that link to the actual MP3 file. Because people do that now with YouTube. You're like, wow, how do they get able to embed a YouTube video? And you're like, wait, that's not. And it dies and launches YouTube. So, yeah. So that nobody's that. Nobody is now. It's, you, most mail uh, programs don't let you do JavaScript inside of the mail client. So it would be great if it was, but not so much. Awesome. All right, cool. If you have more, I'm at schoolofpodcasting.com. And uh, stop on by and... Sign up for the newsletter, subscribe to the podcast.